So good morning, everyone. My name is Helen Sullivan. I'm the Dean of the College of Asia and the Pacific, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you here to the Australian National University this morning. Let me begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australian no. on whose traditional lands we meet, the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. I pay my respect to their elders past and present, and also extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders here with us today. I'd also like to welcome the senior members of the diplomatic community, the private sector, and the public service who are with us today. Thank you so much for coming here this morning on the occasion of this important report on defence industry policy. The report makes significant recommendations and insights on the topic of national importance, and it shows how the challenges it identifies require a truly national response. The report is the result of a joint project between the Australian Industry Group and the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre in the Coralvel School of Asia Pacific Affairs here at the ANU. The Strategic and Defence Studies Centre has long played an integral role in shaping Australian strategic and defence policy. It is Australia's oldest and largest body of scholars dedicated to the analysis of the use of armed force in its political <coughs> And I'm delighted to welcome three of the four lead authors of this report here this morning. Professor Stephen Frawling from the Strategic and Defence Studies Centre, Kate Lewis and Jeff Wilson from AIG. This joint project between AIG and the ANU is a good example of the depth of scholarship and partnerships that we in the college at the ANU want to bring to bear on the major public policy questions facing Australia. And I'd really encourage you all here this morning, whether you're from the ANU, from industry, from the government, to use the opportunity to catch up with each other. I know that there are lots of old friends here to identify common interests with a few people and to develop and deepen the important networks and collaborations that are going to be required uh, to support the implementation of some of the recommendations in this report. I'd now like to invite Ennis Willock, CEO of the Australian Industry Group, to launch the report and outline its recommendations. Ennis. Thank you, Helen, and good morning to you all. I'd like to join with Helen and um, thank you for that acknowledgement, country, on behalf of us. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here on behalf of the Australian Industry Group to launch what we believe is a truly important, a vital report looking at the future of Australia's defence industry. Um, I want to firstly thank the ANU for their collaboration and work with us in the preparation of this report. It truly was a terrific collaboration between um, the teams led by Kate and Jeff and Stefan. So thank you very much and thank you very much for having us here today. It's with great pleasure that we today are here to officially launch the report Defence Industry in a nas in national defence, rethinking the future of Australia's defence industry policy. As I said, I'm delighted to be here uh, along with the co-authors and colleagues from the ANU, including, of course, uh, Professor Brian Schmidt. Uh, this is Brian's last week of, I think, official work, um, and uh, before he tries to have a week off after Christmas while still holding down his day job for the final week. Uh, Brian, thank you so much for your contribution uh, to um, uh, Australia Learning uh, while you have been Vice-Chancellor of ANU, uh, something that we know that will continue in the years ahead in your new role also with this august institution. And, and thank you for making Australia your home. I heard Claire O'Deal, the Minister for Home Affairs, describe you as her favourite immigrant the other day. That, that might be the title of your next book, I would suggest. Um, I want to thank all of those involved in the development of this report, including the AI group and the ANU teams, who both of whom provided their expertise, their skill, their knowledge to inform the report. I'd like to especially take this opportunity to recognise the work of AI group's Head of Defence and National Security, Kate Lewis, and Jeff Wilson, who is AI Group's Head of Research and Economics, as well as the other members of the AI Group team who contributed to this important work. This report is important 
because Australia now stands at a critical strategic jun junction. We are navigating the complexities of the Australian defence landscape, threats of a major conflict, the challenge of shifting and volatile geopolitics around us, and the urgent task of equipping and sustaining um, our Australian Defence Force to fight and to win. If and when we engage in conflict, and we all hope that we don't, we want and need our warfighters to win. That is the bottom line. The Indo-Pacific presents us with strategic, uh, significant strategic challenges and the very real risk of a major conflict. The evolving defence environment, as highlighted in a range of recent defence policy statements, underscores the urgency for strategic re-evaluation. The 2023 Defence Strategic Review declared that our current defence structure is, quote, not fit for purpose, signalling a return to fundamentals and a first principles approach. Not fit for purpose is a sobering conclusion. We can think of it in no other way. According to the review, the end of a prolonged uh, warning time for a major attack now necessitates an urgent call to action, including higher levels of military preparedness and accelerated industry and cap industry capability, capability development. We no longer have, if we ever did have, the luxury of time to prepare our defence. Time is not on our side and time is not our friend. We think this is recognised. The AUKUS Trilateral Security Partnership hit another major milestone last week when legislation to enable uh, the AUKUS agreement passed the US House of Representatives. This is a major achievement. It has not been easy to get this done, and we need to recognise this effort and thank those who negotiated our way through the complexities of the House. The legislation enables the sale of a minimum of three Virginia-class submarines to Australia, eases export controls and allows Australian defence contractors to undergo training in the United States, all of which are very welcome as well as very necessary. The AUKUS partnership further propels us into a new era, demanding a substantial boost in capability, infrastructure, workforce and industrial capacity to support nuclear power submarines. AUKUS Pillar 2 technologies require rapid adaption, innovation and acquisition at an unprecedented pace. In times of potential conflict, a robust industrial sector becomes increasingly critical, ensuring the swift mobilisation of resources and the smooth operation and support of defence capabilities. In this context, the launch today of this report comes at a very important time, both for defence and for the Australian defence industry. The Australian government has adopted the concept of national defence as a new approach to Australia's defence planning and strategy. As the report notes, while many reforms will be required to implement this concept, building and maintaining um, Australia's defence industry capability is one of the most important. The Defence Strategic Review, the DSR, calls for building enhanced sovereign defence industrial capacity in key areas, but it is largely silent on what kind of defence industry this requires or how these requirements can be met. The report we are launching today focuses on these key questions. Industry must be a fundamental element of national defence, deeply embedded in that concept and underpinning defence planning and strategy. We have no option and we have no alternative. To inform the role of industry as a fundamental part of national defence, the report draws on observations from five peer countries, Canada, France, Israel, Sweden and the United Kingdom. The case studies identify how other governments think about the role of industry in defence and how many industry capabil and how industry capabilities are built to meet government requirements. 
Kate will shortly provide us with uh, the detail of the report's findings and recommendations. But however, I just wanted to highlight some of the key aspects from the report, particularly from my perspective as the Chief Executive of the Australian Industry Group. A key recommendation of the report is that the, is that the Australian defence industry should be considered a capability in its own right and an important underpinning of national defence. Rather than being seen simply as a resource that, be, that can be captured separately in a standalone policy, industry should be considered a capability that supports the force in being, but whose strategic value also lies in the ability to expand and rapidly scale to meet operational needs in times of conflict. Secondly, defence industry should be embedded within and managed as part of Australia's broader national industry structure and policy. Since 2022, a suite of new industry policies has been announced by the Commonwealth Government, including the $15 billion National Reconstruction Fund, which currently and pleasingly identifies defence as one of its priorities. However, our defence industry should not be considered as just another sector to be targeted by industry policy. Previous major conflicts have shown that integration with broader civilian industry is required if production at scale is to be achieved. The key words here are at scale. We need to be able to ram up and down very quickly. In times of conflict or looming or potential conflict, that is what we want and need. Scale, I repeat it again. Scale is essential if we are going to be able to quickly develop the capability we need to meet the challenges we face. Embedding defence industry in this way to the broader civilian industry capability of Australia is crucial. This is even more crucial as we move further into the age of digitalisation, where speed and the ability to manage complexity are paramount. Just think of big data analytics, cloud computing, advanced robotics, and of course, artificial intelligence. If we are to compete and win, we must develop, train, and empower industry and its workforce in the skills of the now and of the future. In the world we live in, we again have no alternative. We believe this report is a crucial point in the decision-making process on how we defend and protect ourselves. The report contains important recommendations in relation to strategic prioritisation of critical defence industries with the, with the ability to scale these areas through coordination of programs, the development of export markets and building international partnerships. There are also recommendations around the government's use of the full range of policy levers to shape defence outcomes and strategic par partnering arrangements. And also recommendations around the appointment of a defence industry capability manager, a defence industry czar, if you will, to define the, cap the capability and capacity of the industry the government needs to develop. This role must be held by a person who knows industry and who also knows defence, and who recognises the need for speed to get the two to work together uh, now into the future, now and into the future, as our strategic environment invariably evolves. In summary, the report we're launching today seeks to initiate a national conversation on reshaping Australia's defence industry policy in this time of strategic uncertainty. It could be no matter of greater importance than equipping the men and women of the ADF with the best capabilities, and we need a powerful Australian defence industrial base to support providing <coughs> that. This is a really important piece of work. We hope it informs debate, we hope it informs discussion, and we hope to place some decisions that do prioritise pulling defence industry capability into Australia's broader industrial base something we need to do if we are to seriously recognise the strategic challenges we face. Thank you very much, and thank you to the ANU. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much for these, uh, those remarks.
Um, I'd like, now like to hand over to Professor Brian Schmidt, Vice Chancellor and President of the ANU, to also say a few words, Brian. And thank you, Helen, and thank you for your acknowledgement, country. I, too, I'd like to acknowledge the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet today and their elders past and present. So I do thank everyone for uh, joining us to mark the launch of what I think is a really important part of uh, report on defense industry policy. And I do, it's nice to see Edis, uh, Kate and Jeffrey back from 25 years ago on PhD. Uh, he got lost a little bit because the campus has changed a bit uh, recently. It is good to have him back there, back here. And really appreciate the Australian industry group who's been able to collaborate with the ANU on this project. This is exactly the way we like to work, and it's great to have uh, partners, uh, as, as you have been in this area of our good partners. As the National University, we really do see it as our responsibility to use our research to address the hard question that Australia faces. That is, when we work in partnership with groups like the AIG, we can go through and have the ambition and indeed the capacity to hopefully influence the direction of our nation for the better. ANU was uh, established after uh, World War II, and it was established for very specific reasons to put education and research at the service of national prosperity and for peaceful global development. In 1949, Prime Minister Ben Chifley spoke about ANU and said that scientific research is a necessity for the maintenance of our standard of living and even for our survival. So my guess is that Chifley would have understood the argument and recommendations of this report. Our university's motto is first to know the nature of things, not to be first, but to actually understand what you're doing first before acting. And this report demonstrates how important this is by asking seemingly simple questions that are fundamental to our nation's future progress. What is the purpose of defense industry policy? How can it work? What has to be in place for this to happen? What is the defense industry in the first place? Because these things have changed, of course, over the last 80 years since World War II. Now, by examining how other countries answer these questions, this report has been able to suggest a new direction for Australia. This kind of scholarship, which can advance the national agenda and help shape better policy, is exactly what we like to be able to do for Australia and what we think Australia needs. Because for the first time in 80 years, our nation must think about what we could do to manage and avoid the prospect of major conflict in our region. And certainly, making sure that you're not an easy target is probably the best way to avoid conflict. This year's strategic defense strategic review called for a strategy of national defense that entails a whole of nation effort to develop strategic resilience and a new approach to managing risk. Universities can and should be part of this. I think people started thinking about World War II from the recent Oppenheimer movie, which highlighted the important role that universities and their researchers played in supporting the war effort in the United States. Yet ANU was one of the founding uh, professors, Mark Oliphant, had a seminal role as an Australian in World War II. He developed radar, his group developed radar. His group realized that a fission bomb was possible and launched the Manhattan Project. An Australian did the two most important uh, technological advances in World War II. The other one, penicillin, fluorine, later became the chancellor of AIN. So the government understood that technology is vital to security. During that World War II, Australian University established drug production to support uh, the New Guinea campaign and conducted research in radio technology, which now underpins, underpins our outstanding um, radio astronomy program here in Australia. For governments, universities were a source of experts in fields, including everything from economics, languages, anthropology, and sciences. We try to navigate conflict. But what you might not realize is that government priorities also informed university research. In 1957, when Sputnik was launched, it prompted the United States to completely reevaluate how it worked with its higher education. The fear that the West was falling behind in terms of scientific industrial power 
led to the U.S. federal government to become the main source of R&D funding in the United States. It was not before. So why dwell on these stories from the past? Well, for three reasons. Firstly, because they demonstrate what the long-term whole of nation approach that, uh, approach that this report calls for is perhaps not as foreign to Australia as it might seem. Countries like Sweden and France managed to build national defense industries that serve their strategic needs, as well as helping with their nation building. It's not something that is beyond Australia. Secondly, perhaps more importantly, the investments from the post-war era are still bearing fruit. ANU, for example, still has the only Department of Nuclear Physics in the country, something we have kept open, um, despite, I would say, many reasons not to keep it open, and that is useful, having the heavy eye on accelerated facility that allows us to do cutting edge experiments, but also help us deal with what is the emerging issue around nuclear submarines. We also have a national space test facility, which can go through and fully qualify satellites in all means that you could imagine that provides a sovereign capability uh, that would not exist otherwise. University infrastructure like HIA and the uh, space test facility, which uses HIA, are important because they also fuel small to medium enterprises that simply cannot have access to that type of equipment on their own, but they need so that they can get their products up in the air and off the ground. Thirdly, these examples show us that the defense industry innovation we need is part of a continuum. One that starts with universities and foundational research, because everything starts, like it or not, from the basic stuff like me going after neutron stars merging that seemingly have no relation to anything. But that's how we understand nuclear physics, because it's such extreme inside those stars, you can actually learn things you just simply can't do here on Earth. And it goes through this all STEM disciplines and the humanities, getting these uh, technologies to interact successfully with humans is absolutely essential. And so universities across all the things we do have a great way to contribute. Currently, Australia does not get the same level of economic dividend from defense-related R&D as countries such as the United States. And this is because the funding vehicles and models here are siloed and highly transactional. They don't think about the whole ecosystem. I do believe the recently introduced Defense Export Bill should be supported to enable AUKUS and help Australia protect its interest. Um, it includes, in the United States, research at technical readiness levels one to three. That's the basic research that I do. It gets a pass through. It's going to be published. It's open. That is something that we absolutely need to keep here in Australia. Uh, and failing to do so, I think, would really be a bad idea. And uh, so I hope that that is included in what goes forth. But otherwise, it gives us, I think, a really nice way of looking at how we do work in this area using a long-established protocol developed by the United States, which is um, well understood by universities around the world because we all deal with it when we use USIP. So I think it's actually quite a good jump forward, provided we actually mirror how the United States does. The government has also recently established the Australian Strategic Capability Accelerator, which is an initiative the university welcomes, and we look forward to working through and with the accelerator in partnership with defense industry. The accelerator promises to be much better than early iterations of bringing promising technologies from what we would say is TRL5 and higher. Those are the things that aren't quite ready to be on shelf but are definitely out of the lab of a university. And so we think that's an important part of the puzzle that this report addresses. But where do the ideas and technology that will sustain and feed into the accelerator come from? Well, they come from that TRL123 work done at universities. It is how we can go through and keep priming the pond. And ultimately, this is the research that not only primes the pond, it actually motivates young people to go in and study to begin. If you look at our numeracy in this country, it has been monotonically decreasing since we've been measuring through PISA since 2000. We have to have a national priority at stopping that decline. Some more things for our literacy as well. But giving students things to study, 
that are interesting, that motivate them, whether they're 8, 10, 12. Well, that's also something that curiosity-driven research does because it is truly curiosity-driven. The fact that government is now allocated Commonwealth-supported places specifically to support AUKUS is something that we welcome and is, of course, recognition uh, of the continuum. But it's also an indication of how far we are from where we need to be, how far we are from the kind of uplift of the national technology research and education ecosystem that, for example, followed Sputnik um, in the United States. So the recommendations of this support report launching are far reaching. It is important to think defense of defense industry as a capability in its own right, to embed and manage defense industry as part of the Australia broader national industry structure, to prioritize and support uh, these uh, companies to achieve scale and to use the full range of policy levels at the government disposal. So being able to manage this at the whole of government level will make it all possible and certainly something that I think is at the foundation of this report. Of course, we need to build government exper ex expertise that does not currently exist. Universities working with industry can help. There are changes that we need to make. It will be a generational undertaking, but education is and always is a generational undertaking. And I look forward to being part of that journey to help ensure that future generations have the same safe and secure Australia that we have all benefited from. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brian, for reminding us that the, uh, the giants whose shoulders we stand on uh, are both uh, theoretic, theoretically important but also practically relevant. Um, before we invite some questions from the floor, um, and I'm sure there will be many, I'd like to invite Kate Lewis from AIG to say a few words on behalf of the authors of the report. Ed is the head of the Defence and National Security section at AIG. She joined AIG in 2017 following an extensive career in the Department of Defence, with her final position there as First Assistant Secretary Defence Industry Policy Division, where she was responsible for the effective implementation of the government's approach to defence industry policy. Um, importantly for us, of course, um, we understand that Kate is also an ANU alum, having studied her Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Rules here at the ANU. So, welcome, Kate. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today. And yes, I am indeed a very proud graduate uh, of that <coughs> here in Arts and Law. So it's wonderful to be back here today. It does seem a long time ago, in July 2021, that I visited the ANU office of Pro Professor Brendan Sargent, pitched the idea of a collaboration between AI Group and the ANU in relation to defence industry policy. Brendan was, as always, extremely gracious, full of ideas, knowledge and enthusiasm as we built the project together. <laughs> Tragically, Brendan passed away in February 2022. However, I'm sure Brandon would be proud of the report that we are launching today. Some of you may know I was involved in development of the 2016 Defence Industry Policy Statement. As the previous speakers have demonstrated, so much has changed since then in terms of risk strategy and indeed the shape of our industry. One of the foundational elements of this report is a solid intellectual framework on which policy options can be built. Industry policy can tend to race towards solutions and how questions, rather than taking a step back and working out what we are trying to achieve in the first place. In that context, one of the team's first steps in the project was to develop a framework discussion paper that examined defence industry policy from first principles. It then used the framework to examine the policies of five countries mentioned, asking experts, what does government try to achieve through their defence industry policy? What are the principal policy levers of defence industry policy used by governments? What mechanisms are there for government to develop its understanding of defence industry? We undertook wide-ranging research and sought views through roundtable discussion with state advocates, think tanks and industry members. We noted that defence industry policies can seek to maximise two fundamental objectives. The strategic effect of that industry for defence purposes and the economic impact of that industry for its host economy. We also find our analysis of the countries around the following concepts. Government's ability to define requirements, 
industry's ability to marshal factors of production, and the availability of required factors of production, including infrastructure, trained workforce, intellectual property, and so on. Within this framework, we made key observations from the case study countries. For example, we found that France has actively shaped defence industry for decades through influence on the strategic direction of the industry, direct R&D funding, major acquisition programs, and support for defence exports. France also has a range of important government institutions actively focused on maintaining French strategic autonomy. As another example, Israel has an advanced and innovative defence industry driven by national priorities. The industry's capability planning involves <laughs> close collaboration between the Israel Defence Forces, Israeli, Israeli Ministry of Defence and Research and Development Agencies. And in Sweden, defence and security policy has reintroduced total defence, with the aim being a resilient society capable of withstanding attack. Total defence requires a high degree of government involvement and regulation over all the relevant entities, from military to civilian defence. It was clear from analysis of the case studies, country choices depend on unique economic, institutional and strategic considerations. However, several key issues that are relevant to Australia emerged and form the basis of Chapter 4 of the report, including Defence industry does not operate independently of the ec economy in which it is embedded. It interfaces with and draws on goods and services from broader industry. Second, multiple policy leaders can shape defence industry. We saw a wide range of examples in the case studies, from government ownership, golden shares, restrictions on IP and so forth. Third, formal and informal co government coordination is critical. Many countries encourage close connections and continuous engagement between industry and defence. Fourth, we noted in successful examples the need to balance market competition with long-term strategic partnerships. Many instances of single supplier relationships were evident in the case studies, including as national champions. And finally, international markets offer scale for capacity and capability particularly through international collaboration and exports. So building on these findings, the report makes five recommendations in relation to Australian defence industry policy, reflecting a world where Australia needs to be prepared for major conflict in our region. Number one, Australian defence industry should be considered a capability in its own right, a capability that supports the ADF force in being but whose strategic value lies in situations where the force is fully committed, needs to be expanded and rapidly constituted. What the international case studies in this report show is that such change is possible and that countries can build defence industrial bases that reflect their strategic needs. Of particular importance is the role of the industry in expanding and reconstituting forces during a protracted conflict. The conflict in Ukraine has demonstrated the domestic defence industry base will need the capability and capacity to address non-traditional military options to quickly produce critical components and technologies. This requires recognition of industry as a national capability in its own right, required for the nation to meet the demands of a major conflict. Recommendation two. Defence industry should be embedded within and managed as part of Australia's national industry structure and policy. International experience shows that defence industries are competitive, flexible and scalable when they are embedded in their country's areas of industrial strength. This is important particularly because the ability to surge defence industry production during conflict has historically rested on the ability to repurpose civil facilities and workforce. In that context, defence industry sh support should be integrated with and not simply alongside support offered to civilian counterparts. Third, defence industry should be strategically prioritised and supported to achieve scale and surge capacities. Increased capacity would alleviate current pressures on supply chains, helping to meet Australia's needs and relieve pressure on allies. This is particularly important because adaptation, improvisation and battle damage repair in wartime will have to rest on locally available industry. Four, 
Government should utilise the full range of formal and informal policy levers to grow and shape defence industry. Government is not just a contractual partner. It can also be a legislator, a regulator, a provider of direct and indirect support, a landlord, and a part of full owner. If industry is to become a national capability, it is important government makes intentional and appropriate use of the full range of tools. In addition, changes will be required in culture, processes, and information flow between government and industry. And finally, the report recommends that government should establish an industry capability manager to define the capability and capacity the government, need, government needs to develop to meet the preparedness required. Throughout the case studies examined in the report, overall industry policy objectives are reflected in the internal organisation of how defence interacts with industry. The industry capability manager should have a range of important roles, including understanding the capability and capacity of the Australian industrial base, including its capacity to surge in the event of a conflict. So in conclusion, a defence industry that prepares the country for the challenges of conflict will be a significant national undertaking. The country case studies we examined demonstrate doing so is possible even during the most challenging strategic circumstances. So the team and I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of those from the defence industry policy and business communities who contributed to this project. We'd like to thank the international experts who provided ex exceptional insights for the case study countries. I would note and acknowledge that our research was supported by the Australian Government through the De Department of Defence Strategic Policy Grants Program. However, the views expressed in our report are those of the authors and not the Australian Government or the Department of Defence. Finally, can I take a moment, please, to express my heartfelt thanks to the team from the ANU, Professor Stefan Freuling, who led the team so ably and is just uh, an absolute tower of intellect and, and thought. Thank you, Stefan. Mr. Graham Dunk uh, and Ms. Sahaf Latif. And from AI Group, Dr. Jeffrey Wilson, I had no idea how this report would have got done from my from AI Group's perspective without you, Jeff. So thank you so much. You're incredible to work with. Thank you. Uh, and Mr. Tyler McDonald uh, for all your patience and support and hard work. Thank you for your incredible expertise, your knowledge, your tireless work, and of course, your sense of humour over the past 18 months. It's been an absolute honour to work with you all. Thank you. Okay. Um, Kate, thank you so much for that uh, really terrific uh, summation of, uh, uh, of what's in the report. Um, we now have an opportunity, uh, we have a reasonable amount of time because every, all the speakers kept to time, which is wonderful, um, for some questions for the audience. Um, I'd invite you to uh, please pose a question rather than making a statement and um, identify yourself. If you want to address your question to a particular person on the panel, then please do so. But um, um, otherwise, I will encourage whoever on the panel thinks it appropriate to respond to do so. So who would like to start the questions? Yes. Uh, thank you to um, uh, the AI group and the ANU uh, for the project. Uh, and yeah, for very, very interesting reading. So go to the summer break. Thank you. Um, I suppose my question is, yeah, I'll allow the panel to target it as best they can. Um, with the AUKUS Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, we've seen greater integration between the three industrial bases. To what extent do we need a trilateral industry base, either mindset or specific government framework, to to best distribute um, and understand the three distinct but now inextricably linked industry bases? Um, oh, I'll go first and then hand over. Um, it's a really good question and a really germane question, and it's something that we have been giving a lot of consideration to um, over the past couple of years, quite frankly, as we've seen all this develop and, and evolve. Um, the reality is, is that we're not going to achieve AUKUS and all its aims and ambitions and aspirations unless we have a industrial base that is united and cognizant of each other's capabilities and skills, uh, areas of strength. 
So a couple of things there. We've been working with our sister organisations, our counterparts in both the UK and the US in the defence space to work together on that. And uh, we've done a lot of work, and Kate and maybe we'll talk a little bit about that separately, but around things around skills exchange, information exchange, workforce exchange, none of which are easy because of you know, necessary barriers that are in place by the respective sovereign nations around migration and the like and protection of data, protection of information. So it's been, a, it's been something that we've been working on and, and frankly, we need to speed up our work on, on that front. It's also something that we've been pressing on government is that you're not going to see AUKUS delivered unless you sort of have an AUKUS industry framework in place um, governments you know, rightly made pronouncements and rightly set objectives, but in the end, it's the industry that gets it done. Um, so we, we've uh, been talking to governments in all three nations about the need essentially to have an AUKUS industry pillar, which covers not just pillar one, but also pillar two. And there's now pillar three around energy, of course, which came out of Washington in October. Um, but you've got to have an industrial base that's functioning together. Of course, there'll be competitive tensions at times, and that's natural, but there needs to be an underlying attitude that we have to work together to achieve this. But Kate, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the way we've been doing. Sure, great question, indeed. Thank you. I, and I guess the AUKUS is really such an important new strategic framework that really frames so much of what we're doing in the industrial as part of that. Um, and as Ina said, it, there's been a, a very significant, important amount of government to government work done. Um, but uh, we're really advocating that industry, you know, having um, an industry pillar as part of that. We've been, we've actually got a formal partnership now with uh, the two industry associations in the US and in the UK to really try to operationalise AUKUS uh, from an industry perspective. Uh, and so I think situating industry policy within those uh, larger national security framework, industry as part of national defence is a really significant part of this report. And Stephen, I know if you just want to add to that. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's a, I think it's a very good question. And um, there's no doubt that close co international collaboration is going to be crucial if we are to grow our defence industrial base. Uh, there's a lot of things that we can do together in terms of developing technologies, if you think about uh, in building supply chains and, and critical minerals and the like. But I think it's important to think about what the measure of success is, and that is that in the end, even in collaboration, we need to build an industry in the country that can, within the country, grow and adapt to our capabilities in, 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 the, con in the context of conflict. And I think that that's, that is a big change because... Um, in many ways, our industry, defense industrial policy has encouraged kind of integration into international supply chains and some other things. But if you if your measure of success is that, that doesn't necessarily mean that you build a defense industry that can do these things, that can pivot in, in wartime. I mean, if, if we build you know, certain widgets for the old global JSF program, that doesn't really help us scale defense industry and the kind of capabilities that we need to do in country here. So it is about like more collaboration with government, with it foreign government, with, with particular our August partners on R&D, on building defense and industry. But we need to define requirements and success in a way that we actually, within that broader context, build a defense industry here that can then first address Australian needs. Because we know that if there is a major conflict, you know, um, Br American, British, and whatnot defense industrial bases are primarily going to serve their own needs before they serve others. And I think a good example here is the, I think we cited in the report, the boomerang of, of, of World War II, in the sense that, I mean, it's a, it's a plane that was built, I think, around an American engine. So it's not like Australia could have built the boomerang on its own. But in the end, we had to build a fighter around a transport plane engine because it was the only thing we had available at that particular point in time. And I think that it's worthwhile kind of like recounting some of those older lessons because that's where we're going to head, I think, in the, in the future. Yeah, and I, I do want to make a shout out on the university side of this as well, because we can see that universities drive people-people relations. Okay? So getting um, student mobility, research and mobility across the three countries will help build up the research base for emerging companies in Australia. So it's not just 
people here, you'll get a wider rank. And student mobility are people are going to have relationships, be able to move like fluently, fluidly between the three countries and work on these things rather than us just being silent. So universities have a real um, uh, role to play here, but in the end, you got to have then three-way investment rather than the side of individual investments we have. Here. Okay, well, that's a pretty comprehensive response to, to that question. Uh, <laughs> Other questions? Yes, please. Right, so let me... Uh, David Wade, a former member of the old industry policy area back in the early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, if I could go down to the weeds a bit, to probably address this more to Kate. Um, when I was in that area, the project heads were largely uniformed people taken straight out of operational areas, straight out of the squadron that off a ship and made a acquisition manager. They had no understanding of industry and I've got to say I've worked both industry and public sector, so I hope I had some idea of what was going on. But I was wondering how knowing the problems I had at the time, how CSG today and industry policy in SMI today are accepting and have contributed to this report. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, yes, thank you for your question and, and for all your previous work. Um, I think one of the really significant findings of the report is the importance of those institutional organisations that support industry and, and France is a good example of that. Uh, and it also um, informed the finding and recommendation in the report about the industry capability manager and the industry czar. Um, so we certainly, and to inform that, or broadly we uh, interviewed uh, international experts, but also Australian experts um, across industry think tanks um, and so forth. So I, I think it was uh, uh, well informed and I think uh, your point is very well made that industry policy, industry delivery and uh, procurement acquisition capability development, you need those, that you need military and operational input, uh, you need industrial experience and of course the public service. It's a three-legged stall really supporting those outcomes. Um, before I go to uh, an, another question, I'd just like to, to ask Jeff, just building on, on that point, um, one of the capabilities we haven't really talked too much about is um, the cost-benefit assessment of any of this. And as somebody who is not the defence specialist, but is somebody who now I'm an Australian citizen, I get to vote. Um, one of the things we worry about as citizens is how things that start off costing X amount of money then seem to end up costing much more money. And because it's defence, that doesn't matter. So in this report, do you say anything about the, the ways in which um, as well as priorities of national security and, and building um, industry, that we can actually do that in a way that isn't going to bankrupt the citizenry. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, I guess I'm not either. I'm an economist, so you know, I'm the that rogue on here saying how much is all this going to cost you <laughs> as well. But um, look, this is what when we make these <coughs> points in this report, that I guess to the project team coming from industry seems trivial, which is defence industry is part of industry. We are, of course, it is. You make your stuff. But it, but it actually cuts to what you said there, which is, you know, this view in the public that defence, it's special, defence industry is sui generis, it's often its own budget, with, well, with giant ships and death laces and who knows whatever else, and, and cost overruns on everything and that kind of thing. Um, what we're really trying to say with this is actually asking that question about how defence industry, because it is, for most part, you know, there are some defence-specific components in any military platform, but 90% of it is routine stuff, ships have chairs and, and bolts and washers on them as well. How do you actually connect that to your industrial base? I mean, the observation we'd make is these discussions we're talking about the local capability and defence industry, new technologies becoming into that. You know, Brian's talked about and use contribution on that front to loss as well. This thing is happening across the Australian economy. The challenge Australia has in terms of decarbonisation, uh, a lot of digital transition, AI, and those things are coming in. Um, and so you really see those things playing out. And there's a lot of non-defence industry policy 
that we've seen in Australia the last 18 months. Uh, we mentioned in the comments the National Reconstruction Fund, but there's a laundry list of new initiatives across everything to do this. Um, most of the people that are going to be doing that stuff are also going to be doing that stuff into the defence supply chain. So why are these why are these treated as two buckets would be the first question. We say they shouldn't. But the second one is how you can actually create synergies back and forth between those things. Um, look, our report countenance is some, I think most people can imagine, some fairly difficult international strategic circumstances that we would all want not to have happen. Um, but there's huge applications for a lot of these things that we could do for defence that could then be used across the Australian industrial tech ecosystem. And, you know, to point to the nuclear program and the Manhattan program, by and large, the benefits of that ended up becoming civilian over, over history. So these, these are not just investments for defence. They're investments in Australia's civilian industrial ecosystem that have applications across the board. That's the kind of discussions we're asking people to have about defence industry, not just why does the ships cost so much and why they take themselves to get here. Great. And now I've got everybody. No, no, no. no. You're fine. <laughs> you just, Jeff, Jeff talking, just, I'll just tell the story. And one of the great privileges of my job is I get to talk to a lot of very different people at various times. And early on in COVID, if you can remember those days of uh, lockdowns, trade slowing almost to a halt in some cases. One of the most searing conversations I had was with the CEO of a Defence Prime, doing very important work as Defence Primes in protecting the nation and providing security with a very, very important piece of capability uh, and telling me that they were down to two days' worth of screws in their factory and their workshop at one point, and then they'd have to stop. So it, to Jeff's point, it is not just about the big stuff, it's also about the little things that make stuff happen. Uh, and without those, we can't have the big things. Um, and that's really started, that really reframed conversations, not that incident, but incidents like that, around our preparedness, around, uh, and the framed as national resilience, but it's much broader than that. It's around the scale, the surge capability, as Kate mentioned, but also just running stuff on a day-to-day -day basis that we really need to get right. Great, thank you. I'm going to go to, because we don't have much time, Stefan, and I'm sure there's a, now I've hijacked the thing, I'm sure there's a proper question. Yes, you please, sir. Well, let's assume for a, a moment that uh, all our dreams have been fulfilled and Australia has uh, a world-class uh, weapons industry. Um, how can one be sure that, uh, well, as this world-class weapons industry uh, becomes the envy of, of the world, uh, is it not unrealistic to assume that people might like to acquire some of this uh, 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 technology? And wouldn't this be a, a wonderful boon uh, for uh, export markets? In which case, how does one control to what use uh, uh, these uh, weapons of war are put. I think, for example, of um, the Royal Navy, which became the model for the Japanese Imperial Navy, and how um, British expertise, uh, British expertise uh, assisted in the development of Japanese naval aviation capability, which 20 years later resulted in the sinking of the HMS Repulse and HMS Prince of Wales off the Malaysian coast. Uh, I think also in France. I think we've got, I'm really sorry to cut you off, but we don't have much time, and I think people have got the point. Stefan, I think this is one for you. Super 8 tel dart missiles. No, thank you. Thank you, that's a good question. Um, and, and certainly the report highlights that in the end, as Ines mentioned, scale is a crucial issue if we want to look at defense industry from a, from a strategic point of view and the strategic value of the industry. And exports is one way which you can achieve that. Some countries are very, in, very successful at doing that. Um, now, obviously, when, like, defense exports are a politically and morally, can, or can be a def politically and morally charged issue. I think we have kind of fairly rigorous regulatory environments in Australia around that. Um, to some extent, it also goes to this question about all quiz in the sense that, I mean, um, um, uh, uh, we can, we don't, a lot of the capabilities that we need to build, we need to make sure that we don't build the defense industry of the last century. We need to build the defense industry of this century, uh, which means that there are probably more kind of opportunities for collaboration with like-minded countries in Europe, in the, on the AUKUS partners um, on this. 
if you look at the way the defense exports have evolved over time, in particular amongst the industrial countries, often it's not actually about moving stuff across borders anymore. It's about kind of co-production and actually, you know, license production, setting up infrastructure in other countries. If you look at that as a model of defense exports, I mean, you can look at, for example, AUKUS integration as a way of generating that scale and in a way that doesn't necessarily mean we, we, we get to the issues we discussed before about like not building scale in country and for us, you can defray a lot of the, you know, RD cost, infrastructure costs and so on and so forth. So I think that there are ways, the key issue here is building scale. Exports is one of that. Exports of, you know, closely related civilian technology. If you think of, for example, drones, I mean, Australia probably has a potential to be, I mean, if you look at agricultural drones and so on, large scale industrial drones, I mean, there's probably certain advan inherent advantages that we have in our civilian industry structure, which are closely enough related that you can build the relevant industry at scale. The, the issue though, is that you need to be strategic about it. It's the, it can, it's the strategic outcomes we argue that matter, not necessarily the, like economic, the economic benefits of anything that kind of like is, is being sold to defense. And if you look at strategically prioritizing those to those industries, exports can be an important way of achieving that scale. They're probably not the only one. Okay. I, I guess that, that I'm getting a quite a bit of interest, but I think we uh, are almost out of time. So um, in order to let you have, sorry, is there time for one? I couldn't work out whether you were raising your hand or telling me to stop. <laughs> if I may. Of course. Sorry, just on behalf of, of my news, uh, Channel 9 News, um, if Australia was to join the US mission in the Red Sea, what exactly would that entail? And why does the Australian government seem reluctant to sign an Australian warship up to this mission? Thank you. Because that's from me. That's, uh, Everyone's looking at me. Look, the, the, the request has been made. It will be considered in its natural course by uh, the Australian government. There are a couple of things that obviously need to be considered. The strategic importance for Australia of sending um, what is literally a combat mission uh, to uh, the Red Sea is not a decision to be taken lightly because of the dangers involved. So uh, we have to weigh up the strategic importance there's a lot of talk around, uh, and obviously a lot of focus around trade and what you know, disruption in that part of the world does to our trade. We're a, a trading nation and we trade largely by sea. And so it's not just security, there's also economic interests that need to be taken uh, into account when making this, this decision. As part of recognising that it's a request made by an ally and a request not made lightly either, just as, as the decision needs to be made. So the government has to weigh all that up, the danger, the importance to Australia strategically and economically in making a decision to send um, a ship to the Red Sea. Um, there's obviously enormous um, danger involved in this, given what's what's going on there with, with broader conflict and the unknown of how that conflict could escalate or spiral out of control. So there's a lot here for the government to work through. We would need to obviously operationalise and sustain that mission and have to think ahead too, that it might not just be one, it may be more missions ahead. So there's a lot to consider. I think it's reasonable for the government to consider it very carefully, but they'll, they'll also have to come to a decision quite quickly because it's just not easy just to send a boat out for months at a time. It's a big endeavour. Thank you very much, Ines. Um, we will have to... Oh, okay. The, you've got a very engaged panel. Yes, sir. You will be the last. Um, it's an honour. Tom Worthington from the School of Computing and a former policy advisor at Defence Headquarters in Materiel. I just did a quick search through the report. It mentions training education several times in the, in the national studies but not really in the recommendation was, I wonder if we need a follow-up report on how we're going to combine um, vocational university and industry training to equip the workforce for these defence industries. I think that's not a you, Brian. 
Well, I certainly made the accord process that's going. Um, there is a big focus on bringing those together, not just for defense, but for everything uh, that Australia needs to do. They are siloed now in a way that I think is not serving the nation well. And as we see the future of industry, we are going to need people with a high degree of training on building things, sitting next to people who know how to design things. And having those things be alien to each other, which the current system, I think, reinforces is a problem. So I would hope that part of this might emerge from the accord, but I also think, as, as you know, there will be specific aspects of it that we need, as we talked earlier, to get AUKUS pillar one, two, and three uh, across the line. And if the recommendations of this report are to be followed, clearly we're going to have to have the people to support the Australian industry as we ask it to go and take a giant leap up. Great. And then, Ben, if you want. Well, just, just very briefly, look, there is a process, and Brian intimates it here, regarding all the AUKUS stuff, regarding the nuclear component, the Pillar 2 things, that's been involved in the, the ASCA discussion as well. But we would point that there are broader workforce and skills needs beyond nuclear physicists, so we do need those as well. I mean, I, I point at the moment, 2.7% um, of all jobs in Australian manufacturing, writ large, are vacant at the moment. So when we talk about the defence manufacturer not having basic trades, welders in the right locations with the right certifications. That's also true of a regular manufacturer. So these, this is this really cuts to the point about locating locating this in there. You can have specific defence industry skills training programs for those point of defence things, but we also need general skills training so we have machine fit, fitters across the economy. Great. Thank you all very much to our, our questioners and also to our panel. Uh, this brings us to the end of the formal proceedings. There are refreshments outside which um, uh, enable you to both be refreshed but also continue your discussions. Um, and clearly there is a, a lot to talk about. Uh, if you don't have a copy of the report, please um, do pick one up. A um, uh, couple of thanks to make before we do depart. I mean, obviously, thank you to... Um, to, the, to Kate, to the lead author of the report, and the, the team, Stefan and Jeff, um, for Innes, for, for supporting uh, this. Um, uh, it, I think it is a really good example of what we do here in the ANU. Um, and my final thanks really are to, to Brian, who has always been an absolutely passionate advocate for higher education. Of course, he has a particular affection for the ANU, um, but he has been out there in his time as vice chancellor, really advocating for the importance of higher education and the way in which it underpins all of the kinds of things that that we do. Um, and so it's uh, it's a great privilege that uh, um, this may be. He's not entirely convinced this is his last public appearance, but it's uh, certainly one of them. And it's wonderful to have him here uh, with such a, a well-informed and thoughtful panel. So please join me in thanking all of them. <laughs>